I want to welcome folks back to our 52nd and final Zoom interview, final in this format. Uh, we've been trying to do weekly uh, Zoom interviews since the pandemic started. The first one was actually on May 22nd, 2020, for our main town meeting. And our first presenter was Liam Reardon, a history professor at the University of Maine. And here we are doing 52nd one on July 29th, and it'll probably get posted on July 30th. So that actually works out to be 62 weeks to get 52 interviews in. And if we continue on, which we probably will for a while, we're, we're gonna move to a monthly format rather than a weekly format as we get back more into a normal routine as the pandemic, hopefully we've started to turn the corner on it. Um, we'll have other things keeping us busy here at the library, but um, it has actually garnered quite a bit of interest. So it is something that we will want to continue to post on our Facebook page and continue to have our YouTube channel, the MCS Library. So if you've missed any past interviews, you can always go back and check there. So then I got to thinking, who do I want to be the final person to interview, culminate this uh, almost year long project that we had in it? dawned on me that we should use this as the opportunity to introduce our newest employee, Nicole Potter. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you, David. And Nicole is uh, replacing the position that our longtime librarian slash collection specialist slash archivator, Angie Stockwell, held for over 37 years. And if you missed the interview with her, that was number 16. And uh, Nicole came aboard in mid-June, is that correct? Yes. So what, about six weeks you've been here now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So why don't you begin by letting the audience know a little bit about your background? Sure, thank you. Um, so I've been working in libraries, archives, and museums for a little over 10 years now. Uh, I started actually uh, when I was in high school and continued during my undergraduate degree um, at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, which is in the northernmost part of the state. And then I took some time and I worked at Ghost Ranch in northern New Mexico, which is the historic home of Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, returned to the Northeast to do my graduate work at Syracuse University, getting my master's in library and information science. Um, bounced around for a bit um, in Alaska, and then most recently in Ketchum, Idaho, working at the Community Library Center for Regional History, caring for the historic home of Ernest Hemingway. And I'm thrilled to be back in the Northeast now as the curator of collections at the Margaret T. Smith Library. Very good. Uh, how, when did you decide you wanted to be a librarian? Um, not until I was an undergrad. Um, and so I think I had been working in libraries for about four years at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so junior. And I had tried an internship in publishing. I thought I would go down that route. Um, mm -hmm. Wasn't quite the right fit. And I was really enjoying my time in the Special Collections and Archive Department at St. Lawrence, um, where I was a student employee. Mm -hmm. And then at the time, the director of that department, um, Mark McMurray, he ran an artisan book press. So I worked at his press as well. And I was really intrigued by the idea of the book as object and how you preserve um, specifically books at that time. And then of course, understood and came to learn about all the different facets of archives mm -hmm. and special collections. But that really piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. What do you like about being a librarian slash collection specialist, being in this realm that you yeah. are? Um, well, the, it really goes back to the materials for me. Um, I enjoy the diversity of materials, um, the diversity of stories they hold, um, exposing new audiences to these items um, and to their stories, and then also making sure that they're preserved in whatever format is best for the next generation. Mm -hmm. 
And you have worked at some interesting locations. You mentioned Ghost Ranch, and people probably recognize the name Georgia O'Keeffe, but they may not know her biography. So can you fill people in on that? Oh, sure. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe was a notable female artist um, of the 20th century. Um, and she started her work actually in, on the East Coast in New York um, and in the Finger Lakes region, I believe. Um, the part of her life and her work that I'm most intimately familiar with is her work in New Mexico. Um, and she drove out there, she drove herself and I apologize, I can't remember what year she first came. Mm -hmm. um, and she was just very taken with the landscape there, um, particularly Northern New Mexico, um, and which was very uh, desolate at the time. Um, and Ghost Ranch um, was already developed in some ways and she was able to establish a house there and on Ghost Ranch and then in the nearby town, Abiquiu. And she returned there for many, many years um, and it influenced a lot of her work. You start to see these desert landscapes enter her work. Um, she was fascinated with a nearby mountain, Paternal, um, which she thought God had put there for her to paint. So you see it repeated throughout her work. Mm -hmm. um, so. What did you do there at Ghost Ranch? I had a number of roles. I actually came on as a student worker. This was after I had graduated, um, but I was in that set of um, summer workers for them. Mm -hmm. And so I worked in the museum. There's a museum on site, which is an anthropology and paleontology museum. Mm -hmm. I'm not dedicated to George O'Keefe in any way um, because there's been several significant discoveries both on the property and then in the surrounding region. So um, Native American or dinosaur? Uh, both. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked um, developing educational tools and then as a docent there. And then there's a library on site, which is both a research and circulating library, um, circulating for the guests who stay at the ranch. And so they were doing a big catalog update. And so I worked on that. Um, really, really enjoyed my time there. My contract was coming to a close. I advocated. Um, and got an additional grant to stay on doing that work at first and then transitioned into an archivist role. Um, mm -hmm. So the archive at Ghost Ranch hadn't been touched in many years at that time. Um, so just picking up where the last archivist had left out almost 10 years prior mm -hmm. and adding materials to collection and bringing it up to stuff. Um, so it was a look at the organization as a whole, um, of course, these anthropology and paleontology finds, um, Georgia O'Keeffe's role there, other notable um, figures in American history and pop culture who had came, come to the ranch. It's a popular filming location, so there was a whole film archive. Um, so really doing that work. Any films we would recognize? Um, the most famous is City Slickers. City Slickers just filmed almost entirely on Ghost Ranch's property. Is that Billy Crystal, Billy Martin Crystal, Shore, yeah. Steve Martin? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, the cabin that they stay in was built on the property. You can still visit it. It's the only remaining piece of the set, but you'll remember a lot of the landscapes um, when you drive around. How long were you there for? I ended up being there for just over a year. Okay. And what was the most interesting item you came across in your time there? Um, really enjoyed the photograph archives there and looking at how the land was developed over time. Um, and those were collections that were underutilized previously. So getting the chance to go through them, a lot of it had to be cataloged. None of it had been digitized, making it available to outside guests and researchers. And then even internally um, really expanded what we could do in terms of exhibitions in, at the museum, but then it was used by our communications department. It just felt like it had a large impact in terms of the ranch as a whole, and that was nice. So if people wanted to see sampling of your work, is there a website that they can go to and see some of these photos that you archived? Unfortunately, I don't think it's um, publicly accessible, <laughs> but um, there are historic photos featured on the Ghost Ranch archive, on the Ghost Ranch website. Okay. And what do you remember what the website, well, just Google Ghost Ranch. 
Yes, it's either a .com or a .org okay. Ghost Ranch. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if this is the correct chronological order, but I do remember from looking over your resume that uh, and you mentioned that you spent some time in Alaska. Yes. How did you wind up in Alaska? Uh, yeah, this was a couple of years ago. It was after I had done my graduate work. Ghost Ranch was pre-grad work. Alaska okay. was post. Okay. Um, I got a job actually working for the Alaskan state government as a project archivist. Mm -hmm. um, they were interested in some work that I had done as a graduate student, primarily with digitizing um, mm -hmm. photograph collections um, and putting them on um, open access repositories. So Alaska has a statewide open access repository for photographs and other, other digitized materials. Um, I think it's just Alaska's digital archive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if they want to see where you were and what you were working with, what yeah. specifically would they look for? They would specifically look for the Kodiak History Museum on mm -hmm. Kodiak Island. Mm -hmm. um, so I applied to work as a project archivist. The Kodiak History Museum applied to have a project archivist. And so we were matched. Um, and so I went there for several months um, and digitized photos largely of whaling operations in the area okay. at the turn of the 20th century. Interesting. Do you happen to know, was there a prisoner of war camp on Kodiak um, during World War II? It was. Yes. Because yes. when I was in graduate school, one of my fellow students, that was his dissertation project. Was oh, yeah. No, it. Kodiak has a very long and interesting history, both mm -hmm. in Spalman and World War II, and then um, the Russian settlement that was on, it was the first Russian settlement, it was on Kodiak. Um, and a lot of the whaling operations were based there and then you have a lot of fishing operations based there now um so and of course the naval base that's on the island as well mm -hmm. and one of the other things that i'm remembering is i believe that one of the your references was from kodiak and they spoke about how involved in the community you got they were very impressed by that so <laughs> what is kodiak alaska like um, it is a lovely community. Um, we were, I was there in the summer. My partner came with me actually. So we were there then. So that was very nice. Mm -hmm. Um, not being involved in the fish community can be a little isolating since it's kind of the lifeblood of the island. Um, but we, you know, made different contacts. Um, what I really loved about the organization there was that it was a community driven in many ways. Um, so I had a lot of community input on our photographs. The community was excited to see the project happening and I got a lot of feedback. Um, I was able to post different photos and see if people had information about different ships, if they remembered, you know, the family who owned this whaling operation and what happened to this boat over the years. Um, so just mm -hmm. like a strong and a very strong sense of community and a lot of families who have been there for generation. Um, and so it was nice to be welcomed into that because you can find sometimes with small tight knit communities that they don't want to share the information, but I didn't experience that there. So you just experienced one season of Alaska. Um, I did not. I got I got the end of spring and I got the beginning of fall, but I did not was not there for the winter. But summer is quite remarkable in that. Did you have a 24 hour daylight? Uh, just over 20 hours, 20 hours. Um, 21, I mm -hmm. think we hit, but we weren't far enough north for the full 24. Okay, very good. And in your time there, again, what stood out to you of the collections that you're looking at? What will you remember? Um, I mean, I just didn't know a lot about, about the fishing industry at that mm -hmm. time. Um, and the photographs that were captured, I'm used to turning up the 20th century photos being a little stilted from being mm -hmm. posed in a way. And that was not what I encountered there. And the sea was very alive in these photos. The operation was realistically and brutally captured. Um, they were raw in a way that I personally hadn't dealt with a photograph collection like that from that time period. Mm -hmm. And then you moved on to Ketchum, Idaho, yes. uh, the community library. 
which has many facets to it, but one that caught our interest was it as the final home of Ernest Hemingway. Uh, so tell us about what you did for the community library. Sure. Um, so the community library, um, a department within it is the Center for Regional History. The Center for Regional History has an archive and a reading room at the library. So an archive to store the collections, the archival collections and a reading room for the public or researchers to come and look at those materials. Um, it also operates the Regional History Museum, which is an offsite museum, um, which is open to the public uh, four days a week. And then the final home of Ernest Hemingway. Um, so the Ernest and Mary Hemingway House and Preserve, uh, which is also offsite in another location in Ketchum. Mm -hmm. um, so I was the Regional History Museum Librarian. So my primary responsibility was the museum, its exhibitions and its collections, mm -hmm. but I definitely had projects that took me um, over to the house and um, work, different work duties and projects at the library as well. Mm -hmm. And as we recently learned, uh, because with the library's book group, we just did uh, an Ernest Hemingway novel, The Sun Also Rises, and um, you alerted us to the fact that there are um, two tours of the house available through YouTube. Yes. One is about a 30 minute production by Idaho Public Television, um, hosted by, I think, two employees of the Jenny Emery Davidson, the director of the community library, and Mary Tyson, the director of the Center for Regional History. Mm -hmm. And then there's a shorter, like 10 minute version that Idaho Public Television did which I didn't realize. You can just watch it as a 10 minute video, but I believe you also said that you can, uh, you can do 360s once they you take- You can manipulate it. And so it takes you around the house um, at your leisure and you can pause at certain points to take a look at mm -hmm. the house, um, which was, it, I mean, it's a wonderful example of 19, mid, like mid 20th century architecture and design. It's been mm -hmm. preserved quite well. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, it was built um, by this man, Bob Topping, um, who was actually, he was asked to leave Sun Valley Resort. And this was in the late 1930s, early 1940s, because um, he's having too many wild parties. So oh, he took his parties across the river and built this house on the banks of the Bigwood River. And it's the same cast concrete as the lodge, um, as the Sun Valley Lodge, so it's cast to look like wood. Um, the resort at Yellowstone has a similar look as well. Mm -hmm. um, and he just wanted it to be a place for entertainment. So you see this very large living room, you see um, big picture windows looking out onto the river. It's uh, definitely a kitchen designed for catering. And so it was just one owner before the Hemingways purchased the house. Um, so Bob Topping and then the Hemingways. Was he the developer of Sun Valley or the promoter of Sun Valley or the or both or not? No, he was not. He had um, some money in oil, I believe, okay. um, but he was not associated with the resort in that way, no. Okay. But you were saying the reason that uh, Hemingway wound up in Idaho is he was very much lured there because they, they wanted yes. famous people to start coming to Sun Valley. He was invited at, it was a publicity idea dreamed up by Steve Hannigan, who was the publicist of Sun Valley. And so he invited many celebrities to come stay at the resort because um, that drew the media and then put the resort in lots of photographs and different articles. And as you were pointing out, he didn't actually wind up spending a lot of time there because it's actually where he commits suicide. Well, yes, he lived in the house for just over a year. Mm -hmm. And so you were saying that in many ways, it's more his wife's house, Mary, yes. his, what, his fourth wife? His fourth wife, Mary, um, owned the house until her death, a little over 20 years after Ernest passed away. Um, and she split her time there, um, between there and uh, New York, mm -hmm. um, that she kept the house. Um, and, you know, locals remember seeing Mary Hemingway. Mm -hmm. um, today, you can still talk to locals who remember Mary Hemingway coming to town to go to her PO box or voting in local elections. She kept that residence for many years. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things I learned from one of the videos is that they have a writer in residence program there now. And when you watch the Idaho public television uh, piece on the house, uh, they show one of the artists in residence who is Richard Blanco, who is a poet uh, nationally known because he wrote a poem for President Obama's inauguration. And he actually lives in Maine now. He lives in Bethel, Maine. Yes, he stayed at the house last summer. Um, he was the Hemingway Distinguished Lecturer that summer, and he um, wrote some poetry that he read um, as part of his lecture while he was staying there. Um, but yeah, no, it's a nice connection there, certainly. Um, and the Raiders and res Residency Apartment, excuse me, um, is in the lower level of the house. So they do stay in the house, but not in the historic portion of it. Mm -hmm. um, and the lower level was the garage during Ernest and Mary's lifetime and had been changed or augmented, whatever term you want to use, by previous owners of the house. Um, so wasn't historically accurate anymore when the library took ownership. So we felt, they felt like it was time to, or it was all right to change it in that way and add an apartment. We may circle back again to Ernest Hemingway, but that wasn't your primary focus when you were working for the community library. So what were you doing? What sort of collections were you working with? Um, so the Regional History Museum was previously the Ski History Museum, okay. um, which was run by the Ketchum Sun Valley Historical Society for many years um, before the library took over. So as the name implies, their primary area of interest was in ski history. Mm -hmm. um, Are you a skier? I am a skier. I am a much more avid cross country skier than I am downhill. Mm -hmm. but I could certainly do both. Um, but I learned a lot about ski history during my time there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, definitely more than I knew previously. So um, yeah, so their primary focus in collection was in, you know, materials related to the ski industry and ski technology. Um, and then of course the history of the resort. Um, mm -hmm. There was also a focus on the early history of the Wood River Valley where Ketchum is located, um, mm -hmm. which was a mining area before it was a ski area. So um, taking a deep look at mining history, certainly. And then before mining, there were several Native American tribes who lived in that area. So mm -hmm. you can trace the history of the Wood River Valley um, from the Native American populations who lived there to mining, the railroad coming in, um, and then the ski industry being introduced to that area. Um, what were so they mining? They were mining um, different types of ore. Um, there was a large um, Galena mine, which is, okay. yeah, so. And when did the ski industry start? In the 1930s with the founding of the resort. Mm -hmm. yes. Did you do exhibits? I did. Um, so what there were, were some of your favorite exhibits. Sure. Um, we hosted an exhibit that was developed by the Smithsonian Institute Traveling Exhibition Service, mm -hmm. which was on Japanese internment about an hour south of Ketchum is Minidoka, which is the Japanese internment site from World War II. So we hosted that and then also brought in some artifacts from um, local families who had been affected by Japanese internment. Um, some members of the community who as children had been interred either at Minidoka or other internment sites. Mm -hmm. um, so incorporated their stories and then had an area for community feedback. And that was a rather provocative exhibit and was really well received. Um, so I was quite proud of that one. Um, other ones that are a little bit lighter, you could say. Um, we received a large Hemingway donation during my time there um, from a private Hemingway collector. Um, so exhibiting those materials, which had never been seen before by the public, was very exciting and delving a little bit more into Ernest Hemingway's story. Well, you said lighter, but when I think of Hem Hemingway, I think of someone who's very heavy. So what is the yeah, light like side that. of Ernest Hemingway? Um, it was focused on different periods of his life. Um, we did, it was divided by five cases. And so it was 
the five, like there's five different looks at Ernest Hemingway. Um, so definitely the darkest was, you know, his legacy after he died and taking a look at his death and the effects of his death. Um, but I mean, there's always darkness with Hemingway, but lighter is Hemingway as an adventurer, Hemingway as a father. I mean, certainly there are issues with both of those sides of him, but you can find some happiness. He definitely enjoyed his life in many ways. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, so let's circle back to uh, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, do you have a favorite Ernest Hemingway novel? Um, I've always enjoyed The Sun Also Rises, um, but I definitely prefer his short stories. Okay. Uh, Men Without Women is probably the most famous collection of his short stories. Yes. Yes. Uh, and there's quite a few short stories in that collection. And to me, there's quite a variety. So I, I actually enjoyed that. That's really one of the first pieces of Hemingway that I did. And you see quite a range there in Men Without Women. Um, and we just did the, the Sun Also Rises, the book that we just did uh, for the, the library's book group, um, which I think you said it's essentially his first novel. It is, his, yes, it's essentially his first novel. Um, it's a difficult novel, um, but I think it's maybe, I, I think it's a good look at who he is as a writer. It's very auto, uh, very autobiographical. What he draws on for the rest of his time, you see him drawing on his life. Um, for whom the bell tolls, you know, if I had a, I was kind of in tandem there. Mm -hmm. um, I like the snows of Kilimanjaro quite a bit. I mean, he does have a good bit of range, um, mm -hmm. but he's also a man very much stuck in his own viewpoint and his own life experiences, which he. Well, yeah. I know something that we talked about uh, in the book group, and I think something you had highlighted in the presentation you did, that there's Hemingway, and then there's the myth of Hemingway, and it's almost the myth of Hemingway has become Hemingway. It gets all entangled with him, yeah. I think. Um, it's an interesting case of writer as celebrity. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the first instances you really see of writer as celebrity um, in his lifetime, you know, you see Life Magazine sending out reporters to follow him around while he's in Spain. You see paparazzi shots of him. People were interested in the myth of Hemingway even while Hemingway was alive. And mm -hmm. this is pre-social media. This is pre-constant um, news coverage. Um, so that, that it's a unique part of him. Mm -hmm. That's the position that you are coming to us from. So what was the attraction of this job announcement you saw about the Margaret Chase Smith Library? Well, I have to say that the location was the definite draw. I'm very excited to be back on the East Coast. And then I've always enjoyed my time in Maine, which has mm -hmm. always been far too fleeting. So mm -hmm. getting the chance to be up here was what a large What were your draw. connections to Maine? I had vacationed here. Um, when I was younger with my family. And then when I was in college, I had a dear friend who lived on Mount Desert Island and I came back with her on breaks. Um, okay. I had the opportunity to present at the University of Southern Maine when I was in graduate school. Um, mm -hmm. So I came to deliver that presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so those are my primary connections to Maine. Um, yeah. How, so I, how much did oh. you know about Margaret Chase Smith prior? I remember going to Seneca Falls when I was young and Margaret Chase Smith being featured in mm -hmm. the exhibitions there. Um, and my mother had a poster that she had purchased um, when we were there. And Margaret Chase Smith is one of the women that's um, biographied shortly on this poster. Mm -hmm. So that was hanging in my home. Um, so that was really just the basis of like, oh, I, you know, I've heard of Margaret Chase Smith before. Mm -hmm. um, I've always enjoyed working in archives that are centered around a historical figure. I like um, having that focus. Mm -hmm. um, it makes so it that, easier to, to, to collect. It does. There's a very clear um, collections policy in that case. Um, and then you delve deeply and intimately with one person, but then you see all the parts that make up a life and how many 
other lives this one person touches and just the offshoots I find very interesting. Not that there's anything wrong with any other type of archive or collection. Mm -hmm. um, so there was certainly that. And then, as I said, I had held a position where it was a library, a museum and a historic home. Yeah. Um, but because they were in different locations and just with staffing limitations in many ways, I felt like I was being pulled in all these different directions constantly. Um, and just by the case of it all being under one roof and all having one focus of Margaret, not the community library as an organization and then the historic nature of the museum collections being around skiing and that culture and then Ernest Hemingway as well, but it just all being based in Margaret and Margaret's legacy. Um, I was in, excited, intrigued mm -hmm. by that. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought I could take the skills that I've learned from this position and apply them in a very direct way mm -hmm. to this new one. So you mentioned Seneca Falls uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Seneca Falls is where there was a convention in 1848. Um, and uh, out of it came what was called the Declaration of Sentiments, which they took the Declaration of Independence and made it broader to encompass rights for women. So it's often considered the beginning of the women's rights movement in the United States. And the interesting thing to me is that Margaret Chase Smith gets elected to the United States Senate exactly 100 years later in 1948. So it gives you a sense of how long the struggle was. And Margaret is represented there because it's where uh, National Women's Hall of Fame is located in Seneca Falls, New York. And I believe Margaret Chase Smith was in the first class inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York. So that's why you would have seen her featured there. Yes. So that was an old memory that I was able to draw up mm -hmm. um, at that time. I will say though that uh, when I was interviewing for the position, I remember talking to several women in my life, most notably um, my grandmother, who is apparently a huge fan of Margaret Chase Smith yeah. and was just over the moon to hear all about it. Um, so that was quite the ringing endorsement um, mm -hmm. in your favor. <laughs> where did your uh, grandmother grow up? Where, you know, where she live? Um, in Michigan, and she lives in New York State now. So okay. nothing. You know, she didn't, she wasn't a constituent of Margaret J. Smith, yeah. but was a great admirer of her. Well, she definitely did rise up to the national level. So people all across the country knew who she was. Yes. Well, that's a good testimony. I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, and what are your initial impressions six weeks in? What has stood out to you about the collection, the library, Margaret J. Smith? It's incredibly impressive collection just in terms of the amount and the diversity of material on Margaret's life. Um, yeah, I haven't spent too much time in, I've visited congressional libraries. I've never worked for a congressional library before. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a different type of collection for me. So I've yeah. really enjoyed getting to know it. But then it's very unique in the sense that it's a congressional library attached to and that takes care of a historic home and the historic homes collections mm -hmm. um, and then has museum objects folded in um, as well. So it's been really enjoyable to learn about the different facets of Margaret and then the different facets of the library mm -hmm. and how the collection has grown over time and what's been added to it and the reasoning behind it and what was added to it in Margaret's lifetime um, and what Margaret thought was important to keep and then what people have thought has been important to keep and preserve after Margaret's death as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so one of the things that we had awaiting you was a large box of material that someone from Illinois had sent which pretty much focuses on her run for president in 1964 for the Republican presidential nomination. Um, so a lot of campaign material and, and correspondence. Uh, so that, that's given you one of your first tastes of 
objects and ephemera related to Margaret Chase Smith. How many Margaret Chase Smith pins were there? Uh, 400 plus, Okay, I believe, yeah. There were quite a few campaign pins mm -hmm. in this donation. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, I think with that donation, I've been most taken with the correspondence, mm. um, which is between Margaret and these two women who were associated with the campaign. And the majority of the correspondence is after the campaign. And they keep up the correspondence until it seems Margaret's death. Um, and it's, it, she trusted them. They weren't quite political advisors, but she does ask for them for advice on certain topics, or they, you know, just give their opinions on political moments of the day. Mm -hmm. um, but then, like I said before, it's like the little bits that make up a life, you know, it's mm -hmm. referencing a phone call they had, it's Margaret, you know, sending a Christmas card, it's them saying, well, we'll see you next week and we'll all get lunch. Um, you know, they had a professional and a strong personal relationship as well with her. Mm -hmm. Six weeks in, do you have a sense yet of what projects you'd like to accomplish? Um, I think expanding um, the, um, our digitization efforts to both preserve the items in the collection and then provide more public access to the mm -hmm. materials, whether you're in Skowhegan and able to visit us in person, or if you're on the other side of the country, say in Ketchum, Idaho, you can still take a look at the holdings of the Margaret Chase Smith Library. So that's certainly a focus. Um, We've, I should say we've already taken tentative steps in that direction that you can go on to the Margaret Chase Smith Library website and um, under museum, uh, if you click on that page, there is a button that links to uh, the past perfect database. So I remember, I think it's about seven or 8,000 items, photographs, objects, uh, books that you can get access to and the hope is just to keep expanding. We keep building it. No, I wasn't saying that we were starting from square one, so my apologies. No, no, I, was, I just wanted to I let people it. know that there already is some things that they can see, but there's a lot more that we can make available and hopefully that's something yeah. you'll have the opportunity to do over time. Yeah, no, it's very exciting. Good. Um, increasing the way that we can tell um, just tell stories and share exhibitions either whatever shape that takes you know mm -hmm. is it providing more educational resources is it doing digital exhibitions um different tours or talks similar to the interviews that you've been doing for 52 weeks david you know like how do we increase the way we connect um with our patrons with our visitors yeah uh the pandemic has cut both ways. I mean, it's taken away a lot of our visitation, particularly with school groups, but it has opened up this new technology, which probably most of our organizations are gonna wanna maintain to some extent and pr probably have to use more as well, uh, given limitations that may continue to exist after the pandemic is over. Um, so yeah, it's a brave new world and we'll just have to keep experimenting with it and see how we can best make it work to our advantage. Definitely. All right, well, before we conclude and sort of easing out of the interview the conversation, I thought I wanted to give people a personal look at you. What are your hobbies? When you're not being a librarian, archivist, curator of collections, what do you like to do? Um, well, I like to hike, which is a hobby that we share. Um, I'm just starting to get out into the wilderness of Maine. Um, and I look forward to doing a lot more of that once we get into late summer and fall. Um, I am a baker. I actually have some dough rising downstairs for dinner later mm -hmm. tonight. So mm -hmm. hopefully that turns out. Um, I've been baking at six and a half thousand feet with very low humidity for a few years. Okay. So it's been a shift to mm -hmm. higher humidity and being almost at sea level. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, do you have some special, is it sourdough or some other type of dough? Uh, yeah, I have a sourdough starter that I've had for several years that I maintain. So has it traveled with you around the country to these different venues? It has. <laughs> so uh, I've dried it out for transportation and then I rehydrate it and build okay. it up again. 
yeah. Has it, did it start out in New York? It started out in New York, yes. It's um, an offshoot of a friend of mine gave me some of their sourdough starter and we've been together ever since. And so it's been to New Mexico? Uh, no, it's been to New York and Alaska and Idaho and now Maine. Maine, okay. So are Maine and New York fairly similar? I think so. It's definitely a, just there's more humid. It, well, it's been raining so much. Yeah, it's been a very rainy July. Yeah. Fact, so uh, that's summer. definitely. I don't know if it's the starter or the dough that's having a hard time, you know, but dealing with the rain has mm -hmm. been different. Okay. But I've been really enjoying the rain after living in the high desert for several years. It's been well, nice. I'm going to give the plug um, that um, I believe it's this weekend is the the bread fair at the Scoggin Fairgrounds, which is held annually in years that, that there aren't a, isn't a pandemic going on. Um, I will be there. So if anybody sees me there, say hello. Very good. <laughs> and get out into the community a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of hiking, you grew up in northern New York. Have you done all the Adirondack 4,000 footers? I was just looking at that and I think I've done all 46 but i never conf i need to i never did the whole you're a 46er okay yeah so um that's impressive I for, yeah thank you i was looking through my notebook because i write down all my hikes and i mm -hmm. think i've done all 46 okay. so that was um mainly in college focusing on that um and then it's i've been very lucky to have good hiking everywhere i've lived mm -hmm. Did you do some hiking out in Idaho? I did, yes, yeah. um, in the Sawtooth Mountains, which is part of the Rockies, cutting okay. through Idaho on the way up to Canada. So what elevations were you doing there? Getting up to 8,000 um, mm -hmm. at the summit, usually. Mm -hmm. And in Alaska? Hiking on Kodiak, yes. Yeah. Uh, mountains there? Yes, yes. What's There's, their what's their elevation? Uh I can't I think we're getting up to about three thousand, maybe four. Um but I can't quite remember. This was some years ago. And you were in northern New Mexico? Yes. Which is mountainous? Yes, it is. Um though I stayed a little bit closer to home, Ghost Ranch is beautiful and ended up doing a lot of hiking there. So instead of mountains, it was a lot of mesas and canyons. Okay. So a different landscape for sure. Have you done any main 4,000 footers yet? No, and I need to talk to you about which one I should tackle first. Okay, I can give you some advice on that. Uh, and the other thing, I mean, it may just be so much a part of your life that you haven't mentioned it, but I think it was one of your majors in college. You like books, You're not just taking care of books. You like reading books, right? I like reading books. Um, I like making books. I like oh, okay. taking care of books. I all facets of books. So um, when you say making books, tell us about that. Well, I worked at a press when I was in college. Um, so that was a Vandercook press. So I, my main job was laying, laying the text bed. So I would lay the text bed for all the pages. Um, and so we printed several editions while I worked there. Okay. Um, so I was involved with that side. I didn't really bind at that time. I wasn't binding the books. Um, that's something I was certainly interested in and carried it on to graduate school um, at Syracuse University. I worked at Bird Library in mm -hmm. the conservation lab and um, under David Stoko there, who's the conservator. Um, he also teaches a class on bookbinding, which I took. Mm -hmm. um, I got to learn a lot about the conservation of bookbindings and also the process of binding um, and learned um, how to bind different types of books and different um, historical binding techniques. Um, then I've taken some workshops on that and continued it on, um, so. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, is that something you can pursue as a hobby? Do you still do make books? Yeah. And book uh, I'm hoping to get back to it. Um, it kind of got away from me during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that I've done with friends more than anything else. And I've always enjoyed um, 
going to different binaries and different workshops and learning from different people. And so I'm hoping to tap into that community, which I'm, I know exists, but mm. I haven't yeah. explored that. So you, you really truly are interested in the book as an object. I'm really truly interested in the book as an object and mm -hmm. the book as a, a conveyor of knowledge, mm -hmm. both sides of it. Okay. Who are your favorite authors? Oh, <laughs> um, well, my focus in undergrad was in English literature. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did a deep dive into Shakespeare. So I'll okay. reveal that I do enjoy Shakespeare quite a bit. I don't know if he's my favorite author, but I um, certainly enjoyed him. And mm -hmm. I also spent quite a bit of time with Jane Austen during that time. And I was just revisiting Emma last week and remembered mm -hmm. how much I love her. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say, and then uh, since, th since then though, I've spent a lot of time reading contemporary authors. I just finished mm -hmm. a memoir, which I thought was beautifully written um, mm -hmm. by Ashley Ford called Somebody's Daughter. Um, that's been on the New York Times list for a couple of weeks now. And I thought that was just lovely. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to jump around more now than I did. Um, do a little nonfiction, do some fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping to get my hands on some poetry soon. It's mm -hmm. been a long time. Okay. Would you consider yourself a bibliophile? I guess I like books a lot, so sure. Okay. All right. Well, then you pick an ideal profession then. It has worked out. Very good. Well, I hope you have a, a long and fruitful career here at the Margaret Chase Smith Library. And thank you for taking the time to introduce yourself to our viewers. And hopefully if they have questions about Margaret, they will contact you. And um, if they have a more deep interest and want to see what we have here in terms of the museum in the house and the collect library collection hopefully they'll come and visit we're actually at a point now where some of the restrictions are being relaxed we do still ask people to make reservations if they can it's helpful for us to, to be able to be ready for people to come um, so thank you very much thank you this is great all right bye bye <laughs>